So Cecilia, a very, very warm welcome to Researcher's Desk. It's lovely to have you here with us. Cecilia is Professor of uh, Education um, and uh, is also a really good friend. Uh, I enjoy working together with Cecilia on a lot of different projects, educational projects, and it's always, been, it's always an inspiration. And it's really clever, lovely to have you with us. Cecilia, you're going to talk with us about pupils' perceptions um, about climate policy, and uh, we're all super interested to listen. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to turn my own camera off and let you share screen, but I will jump in immediately if something goes wrong. So I'm going to be there in the background. Um, and uh, so a warm welcome to Researcher's Desk, Cecilia. Thank you very much, Alistair, and um, thank you for the kind words. Um, I will share my screen. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and um, would like to welcome you also to the seminar. Uh, I'm professor of educational science uh, with a specialization of teaching and learning in the social sciences. Climate change is caused by consumption of goods and services that emit greenhouse gases. It cannot be saved on a voluntary basis or the coordination of voluntary action and a third party or actor is needed. Such an actor is the government, can be the government, uh, and using policies such as carbon tax, subsidies, regulation, and bans. Policies affect price, consumption, production, and also innovation and structural change. I like to highlight innovation and structural change because it's seldom mentioned by um, politicians, but an increase on carbon tax will affect uh, researchers, uh, entrepreneurs, people in um, technology and so on. The most important factors for support of policy are that they are perceived as effective and fair. Oops. And this requires citizens' knowledge of policies, such as carbon tax, which reduces greenhouse emissions. What affects action? In environmental psychology and environmental education, we talk about internal and external factors. Internal factors or constructs are personal norms, knowledge, value orientation. External factors are what the situation provides in terms of, for example, public transport. If we look at knowledge, <clears throat> this has of course been um, an important <laughs> interest in what the role of knowledge plays. A very common model called Cobb model, knowledge affecting attitude, affecting behavior has been challenged. And there's a great paper summarizing this by Thomas and Ayaman, the, the most downloaded paper at the journal Environmental Education Research. However, knowledge has mainly been focusing on natural science knowledge. So assuming that if I understand how cl climate change work and it exists, it will change my action. Action is also uh, differentiated and we use it in this sense in our projects direct and indirect action. An example can be uh, me taking the bus and indirect action is me supporting public transport. In our work, we measure direct action through the willingness to pay higher prices uh, for goods and services emitting greenhouse gases. And we measure indirect action through the willingness to support policies on taxation, subsidies, regulations, and bans. Another dimension or construct, as we say, has been value orientations and its effect on action. And here I quote, the propensity to act environmentally friendly is associated to the relative value an individual attaches to the three value objects, the self, other people, and nature, and the anticipated consequence for the highest ranked value object. And here I'm sharing uh, these three dimensions that we measure, egoistic value orientation, altruistic, 
and biospheric. And in others' work and in our own work, we can see that uh, altruistic and biospheric value orientations affect our, um, our action in terms of policy support, for example. And I, and in our work, we have also been interested in looking at, or about 15 years ago, I was really interested to know what role does knowledge play, social science knowledge, and what role does value orientations play? I will now share some research uh, findings, my own and others. So a longitudinal study of upper secondary student changes in beliefs, val values, beliefs, and norms. This study showed <clears throat> that student perceives taxes to be effective policies for dealing with climate change and supported higher taxes and prices. Changes in these conceptions had a greater impact for support of climate taxes than a change in value orientation. And here I like to show a picture of this values, beliefs, norms for action model. Uh, it's complex, but really to make the point here that we are looking, what we could find is an item such as I am willing to support political proposals for increased tax for petrol, which is a um, support for um, uh, policies or public action. And we found the following. Belief in the efficacy of taxation was directly associated with change in norms for action. It was positively correlated with change in readiness to accept higher taxes and with change in readiness to accept higher prices. And we conclude, given that expenditure taxes which raise prices form a major part of tax policy opportunities, this consistency is encouraging. In another project, we also looked at this this included a questionnaire with more than 2,000 uh, students in the uh, social sciences in Sweden at eight universities. And one of our findings shows that economic students show stronger support for subsidies and taxes than students in political science and law. They also see these policies as more effective. And based on these findings and other that I will report, I will come back to a, a current project that we are uh, involved in at the moment. Also, a research review on policy support, a meta-analysis of uh, all, all studies, I think in three, 33 countries around the world, conclude the following. Most important factors for support of policy are conceptions of effectiveness and fairness. So in our project, we initiated a survey on effectiveness and fairness with 340 students who were 15 to 17 years old. And the focus was on students' conceptions of effectiveness of carbon tax, subsidies and bans, and fairness of these in relation to the willingness to pay higher prices and willingness to support policies. And what did we find? Well, <clears throat> we find that there is a willingness to pay. So conceptions about effectiveness and fairness, students who think policy instruments are effective are more willing to pay higher prices. And students who think policy instruments are fair show more willingness to pay than students thinking they are unfair. However, in data, we can also see those, those thinking it is unfair are willing to pay. Regarding willingness to support policies, conceptions about effectiveness is related to willingness to support policies. Thus, students who think taxes are effective show greater support of tax than students who don't think they are effective. What we find here, and we, we, what we also think is interesting, is that students think bans are effective show low support for bans. I will come back to this later. Now moving to climate change education. A quite recent review of research on climate change education conclude that economic, 
legislative and political aspects of solving climate change are not addressed. This is a review of 77 um, studies on climate change education from I think the last 30 years. The author, authors write, regulatory instruments are only mentioned three times while environmental taxes or emission trading are not mentioned at all. Thus, we can conclude there is a gap between what we know from research on effective means of reducing greenhouse gases and what's done in climate change education. Research also shows that students and teachers have poor economic understanding or sadly, <laughs> that teachers don't think they have knowledge to teach it, although they have knowledge to teach it. And third, teachers see policies such as, such as taxation as a controversial concept, which leads to avoidance. And this is actually also something that we have seen in our own project where we're working with uh, teachers. In a current project, we are developing teaching that supports learning of policies in year nine. And I just like to share some, um, some of the first intervention of cycles that we did. Um, we call them cycles because we're now planning for the third cycle. We use comparative interventions, which means we have a main intervention, which draws on research. Uh, and we designed the instruction to focus on concept maps. They visualize concepts and they visualize relations and help systems thinking. <clears throat> and in an example here is just to show what this concept map task could look like. Uh, the first one here is on uh, the price mechanism and we changed wordings to sellers instead of demand and buyers instead of, um, I mean, sellers uh, instead of supply and buyers instead of demand. And then the second tasks, we focused on what would happen to petrol if there's an increase of carbon tax on petrol. As students worked in groups of three with these concept maps. So what did we find? We find a statistically significant increase of understanding tax and subsidies between pre-test, so the test before we start the intervention, and post-test two in the main intervention. We did not find any significant increase in the alternative uh, intervention. And just to share with you um, what we're preparing now in a couple of weeks, we like to focus more on tax affecting markets in plural and relation between markets. This is also seldom addressed, but an increase in carbon tax on petrol will not just affect the car petrol market, but also other markets, um, well, for example, electric cars, but also, um, uh, public transport. We also like to focus more on the effect of innovation of taxation. And we like to design instruction um, because we did not find a significant increase of understanding using these concept maps. So we're changing that task to have an example of petrol cars by 2040, which is a part of the uh, EU and was proposed, and have students think about a short and long-term perspective, because we can see in the written responses from our students that they either think bans are just great because there will be no emissions, or stating bans, are you mad? There's going to be chaos. <laughs> so we think it can help students to think in a short-term perspective and in a long-term perspective. And in a long-term perspective, we also can address uh, its effect on innovation and structural change. I'd like to close with some um, reflections of what I think needs to be addressed in climate change education based on this review. 
The review concludes that there's this focus on the individual and the private sphere. It can be understood probably when I talk to teachers because teachers want to find an example that is close to their everyday life and so on. But we know from research on conceptual change in social science that this is the way the students already perceive the world. They focus on the individual and change comes about through the individual, the individual or multiple individuals. And it's difficult for them to, they need education to think about it in a structural meaning. But focusing on the individual knowledge and action, it's important to focus on political influence and the experience of political influence, which we address and talk about as citizenship knowledge. An example in this review by Kranz is a school where the students influenced and had an impact on their local politicians to build bike and walking route. So they did not need to take uh, the car. I also think educational consumption needs to not focus on the so-called moral dimension of going and buying um, certain goods or flights or whatever, but understanding consumption. We buy things because they are cheaper or because of social norms. Also, having an impact, a real impact through consumption is more at the school level. Schools use energy and can change energy to renewable energy. I also think that this would help students to experience and know that they can change, but it's very difficult at the individual level. Perhaps also here is um, it's, it's, we can address a, a concept like market failure and so on. And finally, a focus on society and solutions education on effective measures that redu reduce greenhouse gases at different levels of political decision making. In a Swedish context, we have the level of commune. We have the regional level who decides on public transportation. We have the national level, which I've talked about in terms of policies on carbon tax and so on. We have EU and the carbon trading market and the international level. and connect these levels to the influence, to influence and citizenship knowledge. Finally, I just like to acknowledge um, the Swedish Research Council who have supported uh, these projects that I, I have been talking about. And thank you for listening. And thank you very much indeed for a really instructive and, uh, seminar. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today.